Hello and welcome to the latest session of our podcast today. I'm delighted to be joined by Lisa Nandy, who is the Wigan MP for the second time. Uh, Lisa's been an absolute hero for the football club in the last week, fighting our cause and obviously drawing attention to the, uh, the wider media and the FL. Uh, so Lisa, can you give a, a bit of an update since when we last spoke? Um, yeah, I, you know, every, at the moment, every day just feels like about 100 years, so I can't quite remember where we'd been when we last talked, but a lot has happened since. So, obviously, the sports club has been raising lots of money, which has been amazing. They've been really careful about how that money is spent, so they're making sure that it's going directly to the club in order to make sure that they can complete the season, which is great. Um, and I, you know, I've had several meetings with them. I feel very confident that that money is in really good hands and is being used really well. Um, and the bigger issue, I suppose, is that I've met with the administrators and um, also obviously been talking to lots of people who are interested in buying the club, um, including Ian Lenigan, who went public with his bid um, last week. Um, and we've been working to see whether that bid can become viable or not. Um, and then I suppose the biggest thing as well is that I've had a meeting with the EFL, with the chairman and chief executive to discuss what they can do to help us. And um, I think I came away from that meeting feeling much more positive. But obviously, this week is absolutely critical for us. We've got to get a good bid Um moved into preferred bidder status as quickly as possible to prevent a fire sale of the assets behind the club and then we've got to get that bid approved and then we've got to start bringing things back together and repairing some of the damage that the last few weeks have done. It's been an absolutely whirlwind of, of a week. Uh, how did the, the meeting with the EFL go on your standpoint? Obviously you said you felt a lot more positive. Uh, what was the, the, the purpose of the, of the uh, meeting and, and the focus of that? Well, I mean, a number of things. We obviously discussed the issue about a 12-point penalty um, that I'd written to them about previously. It's my strong view that Wigan Athletic shouldn't be punished for the failures of the the current approval system, you know, the owners and directors test. I think it's now widely accepted in football and in politics that that is not fit for purpose. It's just not worth the paper that it's written on. And there's been an acceptance of that actually for quite some time. So it really is quite scandalous that we've allowed this situation to drag on and that, you know, a club like Wigan Athletic has been pulled into it. So we discussed that and, you know, there's an appeal that the administrators have put in about the 12 points. That appeal is ongoing. So there's a limit to how much the EFL could say to us, but obviously, you know, our views about that are, are clear. I mean, it looks like we may well stay up anyway. If we keep winning 8-0, then um, we may well stay up anyway, and that may not be an issue. The, the most pressing thing, if I'm honest, is about securing the club's long-term future, and that's really what I wanted to talk to them about. We need help from the EFL. They have a duty to make sure that they only approve bids that are viable, And so we need to make sure that they are using that power to um, to ensure that the the bid that comes out of this process and goes forward to the EFL is one that is um, is one that is going to secure our long term future. And when I met with the administrators, you know, it's a positive meeting, but. Obviously, they're uh, they're under a duty and a pressure to get the best price for the club, whereas what we want to do is secure the club's long-term future. Now, those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. We can work together to see if we can find a way to do both. But the EFL are absolutely critical in that. And there have been mixed messages coming out of the administrators through the media this week. Um, They told the Wigan Evening Post that they were going to go for the highest uh, bid possible. They then told... Um, talk sport that they were going to obviously try and get a good bid and a viable bid um, the EFL are an absolutely crucial safeguard in that and that's what I wanted them to know and I think they do know that um, and um, I just impressed on them that we need the, their help now um, in order to make sure that we've got a club in a few weeks time. What is the time scale over the next couple of days to obviously find the buyer and find, find the right buyer? Um, so uh, they've got until the 21st of um, 
what to say June but we're in July aren't we uh, 21st of July it's been in lockdown too long um uh, uh, they've got to give it that window in order to allow bids to come forwards um and what I hope they're going to do what they've told me they're going to do is try to move to preferred bidder status pretty quickly what I don't want is the process dragging out um, there was a concern at the outset that because the administrators are paid by the hour that there was a you know, there was already a built-in incentive for the process to be strung out for longer. Um, and I discussed that directly with the administrators and said we can't afford for that to happen. That would mean more player sales, potentially mean us losing key assets like the training ground in order to meet the ongoing costs. Um, so we need we need to do this relatively quickly. So the next few days are going to be pretty important. And obviously there's a local bid on the table. Um, if we can get that off the ground and make it viable, then we'd be in a much better position this time next week. It was announced that there's about 60 interesting parties in, in buying the club. Uh, how many of those parties, uh, in your in your opinion, are serious? Um, not many, I think, is the honest answer. Not that it means that we're short of options. There are options. But, in, in you know, buying a football club is quite a big deal. And um, I strongly suspect that most of those bids aren't serious. That's not that's not necessarily a problem at all. Um, it's just a question for the administrators. They've got to whittle that down pretty quickly. Um, they've given a requirement that they want to see proof that people have £10 million up front before they'll enter into serious negotiations. I think that's a bit steep, if I'm honest. I think if you've got something like a, you know, a local bid on the table from... Um, a group of people who have a long track history of running things like Wigan Warriors, then it would make sense to speak uh, to speak to them more quickly. Um, but you know, it's one way of whittling down the process. And I think probably what you'll see coming out of that is is a handful of of serious offers. And um, we've just got to make sure that 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 is the case and that we get the right one. Absolutely. And, uh, and it, when I take over half of a football club. Usually takes around six weeks, obviously, uh, due to uh, the fit and proper person's test, otherwise known as the owners and directors test. A lot of fans are concerned of, obviously, what happened uh, with the previous owners. The fit and proper person's test, as you said earlier, isn't fit and proper at all. Yeah. Would you think it'd be uh, fair to the fans to be a bit concerned of, of that test being opposed wrongly again? Yeah, I mean, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to meet with the, the top people at the EFL, because we need we needed to have that conversation early. Um, I, I mean, you know, Rick Parry did an interview on um, Talk Sport, I think it was, where he talked about how Wigan have been really badly let down. And I think there is genuinely a sort of feeling um, in and around those circles that they know that this is, you know, we, we've been put in a terrible, terrible position. You can argue about where the blame for that lies, you know, whether it's, you know, the clubs that won't come together and change the system, whether it's, the government, who should have exerted much more pressure, I've been trying to get them to do it. I've been speaking to the sports minister um, about it. And today, uh, Alison McGovern, who's the shadow sports minister, has also called on the government to make uh, much more rapid changes to the way that the owners and directors test operates because it's just not fit for purpose. So there is mounting pressure on that. And that's that's really good news. It's good news in the long term, but it's also good news for Wigan right now because I think I think people who are making these decisions do feel under pressure to get that right this time. And uh, I am watching them like a hawk to make sure that they do. Um, and there are a number of us who are. So, you know, there are, there are safeguards in the system now for fans, I think. They're not at all as robust as they ought to be. The system does not work for fans. And I've said that before, I'll say it again. But... Um, but there are, you know, there are a number of people now who are who are pushing very, very hard to make sure that we get the right decision. And like I think I said to you, Jay, at the, at, when we did the first podcast, this is my absolute number one priority at the moment. And I'm just not going to rest until we've got that long term resolution that's in the interests of the club, the fans and the town. Absolutely. And, and uh, in that in that answer, you uh, prompted me to ask the next question of. Do you think the crisis that is currently happening at Wigan Athletic will lead to a possible change in the way football is run in England? Um, it has to, surely. This has to be the moment. So the Supporters Club is starting a petition, which to the to the parliamentary website, if we get over 100,000 signatures, we'll get a debate in Parliament. Um, and so once that goes live, I'm very keen that we push that out as far and wide as possible. 
Um, I, I think every conversation that I've had with anybody, whether it's the sports minister, the EFL, the administrators, other clubs, football journalists, I think people really strongly believe that change is long overdue and has to come. It should have come when Berry collapsed. Um, it absolutely has to come now. I should have said as well that the other thing that I discussed with the EFL is about this inquiry that they've agreed to do into what happened at Wigan Athletic, because... You know, my argument has always been that if this can happen to a good club like Wigan Athletic, it can happen to absolutely anybody. So we need to understand what has happened. Um, and I've been doing some inquiries through the Hong Kong Stock Exchange to see if I can get more answers. There are other people who are pursuing it as well. But the EFL have said that they'll do an inquiry. And when I talked to them about that this week, they said that they were not going to delay that inquiry. They've already started setting that up and they are absolutely determined to get answers for Wigan fans about what has happened. Now, obviously, it's not my job to, to promote that. It's my job to hold them to account and make sure that that happens. But I did feel very encouraged by that. I think they, they feel very strongly that we've got to have answers and that we've got to use that to inform what happens next. And that will be the catalyst for wider change in football that puts fans right back at the heart of the game. I think that's all Wigan fans can really ask for, to be honest, because to see that the EFL are taking an active approach of what's happened, it, it gives a lot of reassurance. A lot of fans are, a lot of fans are concerned, and we have to thank yourself, uh, Andy Byrne, everyone who's been helping us. I know you've you've been working tirelessly doing this, and I just like to ask how, how have you been during this, and how much has it affected you? Because obviously. You are the Wigan MP, but you've got a lot more responsibilities to obviously put this as your priority. It just shows how much the club and everything about Wigan Athletic means to you. That's that's really kind of you. It's nice to, nice of you to ask as well, because I think a lot of people are struggling at the moment with, you know, obviously with lockdown, with COVID. Um, is I sort of feel quite overwhelmed by the amount of people who are who are finding it hard to cope. At, at the present time a lot of the people who get in touch with my office at the moment they get in touch with a particular problem you know whether it's the furlough scheme ending or not being able to access PPE but then behind that is a lot of things that they're trying to deal with and I think that the what has been allowed to happen to Wigan Athletic has come at exactly the wrong time for a lot of people um, and that mental health initiative that you've been um, that you've created and uh, have been pursuing, I think is really, really important because people, you know, this is an emotional thing for people. It's an emotional thing for me. You know, the Wigan Athletic has been the beating heart of this town for nearly 90 years and it's bound up with everything. You know, you go to the football with your friends, with your neighbours, with your family. It's, you know, country, it's part of the, the fabric of the town it's you know wherever I go in my job that's I find Latix players or coaching staff or um, community um, trust staff doing different brilliant things and so yeah it's been really emotional I have to say the, the hardest bit for me was when I went down to the club to see the press conference before I met the administrators and I think the the impact on the staff you know, the fact that they were still down there, many of them having been made redundant, working around the clock to try and save the club, it did have a big impact on me. And I, I just feel a level of responsibility around this. I haven't really slept for the last 10 days. And to be honest, I probably won't sleep until this is done. But that's OK, as long as we get it sorted. Um, and then we can move on to, you know, wider changes and what needs to happen in football. And I'm determined that we're not going to um, stop pursuing that but we just got to get this the long-term future of this club secured and then we can all have a good night's sleep absolutely I can't echo that enough and you should be so proud of yourself of what you've been doing for this club it, it means a lot and thanks for raising the uh, mental health group so for anyone who doesn't know we, we've set up a group called the Wig Athletic Supporters Mental Health Group which is a, a way fans could connect meet new friends and have someone just to chat to during these tough times it's a safe environment where if you do have any anything to talk about, whether it's anxiety, depression or any mental health related things, uh, we're all here for you. We're all here to talk. And I feel like in a time like this, it's so important to, to be there for one another. It's not hard to be kind. It's not hard to, to be nice and look out for one another. And I think it's so important to do this during, the, during these unprecedented times. And um, so far, we've had since last week 160 members uh, and they are mostly male. And I think that is a massive um positive for me because uh, with mental health the the overwhelming thought is that the stigma lies mainly in men because uh, men sometimes think it is a sign of weakness to talk about it when in reality it is okay not to be okay 
Um, I think it's um, I think it, that's amazing. I didn't know that a lot of the people that are attending the group are men as well. Um, and that's really great because, like you said, stigma is one of the biggest problems with mental health. It's one of the big, biggest barriers to people getting help. And I just feel at the moment that there's not many avenues where you can go. Um, at the moment, I've got like I've got uh, friends who've been bereaved. Um, I, I think a lot of people know people in that position and yet you can't get out of your house you can't talk to people you're not seeing people often the way that you cope with that is to go back to some kind of normality but there isn't a normality at the moment and and football is a big part of that so it's I can see why you know I can just understand why it's having such a big impact on people at the moment it's so great that you're doing something about it and I think it reflects the fact that Wigan Athletic is a family and I've always felt that from the first day that I went down to the club and met all the um you know the chief executive and the players and the staff I, I was really touched the other day when a friend of mine whose dad has been made redundant um got a phone call from Paul Cook um to say you know really sorry to hear it and you know still here for you and apparently he's done that with all of the staff who've been made redundant. I mean, it just tells you what sort of club this is and why we're all so determined that we're not just going to save it, but we're going to carry on, um, not just surviving, but thriving, like the other night, 8-0. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, that is a club that is not going anywhere. The fighting spirit is there. Uh, the heart is there. And we've just got to make sure people like me, who have some ability to influence what happens over the next few days, we've just got to make sure that we get there and that we protect that because it's really precious. Absolutely, and, and thank you for the uh, endorsement of the Mental Health Group. Uh, if anyone would like to join the Mental Health Group, uh, if you follow myself on Twitter at jwhittle6, um, there is information on how to join. Emerson Boyce, obviously the club legend, uh, FA Cup winning captain, he's a group ambassador. So if you ever want to chat with Emerson Boyce, I know uh, he, he's going to help out when he can. Uh, we've we've had a lot of support. We have uh, appointed a few informal mental health advisors too, who have professional mental health experience. So, if you do need help beyond just just a chat and just a friendly face, we have got a professional outlook as well. Uh, so we we just kind of want to make a difference on that point of view because um, personally, for me, I've not really talked about this before, and I I didn't really plan on uh, this time last year. I remember my family had a really tough ordeal with mental health. She. She couldn't leave the house. She, I think I, I became a full-time carer. And for me, it, it broke me. And it was probably the, the toughest period I probably had in my 20 years of living. So for me, I, I don't want to see anyone go through that. And if I can help one person from going through that, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can. So please, if you if you do want to chat, reach out, because we're going to support you in every way. That's the way athletic way. Um, we not only believe, but we, we look out for one of our own, because we are a big family. It's amazing. Um, and uh, I'd like to obviously thank Lisa for obviously coming on the podcast today. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to say a final message to Wigan fans um, well, of, I'm of just, the next few weeks. Jay, thanks so much. And I'm just, I'm really desperate to come on this podcast and just say, didn't we do well? We sorted it, we've cracked it. And now here's what I'm going to do to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone ever again. Um, you know, and I, 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 it's hard, this, it's really hard. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert in football finance at all. I've become an, an armchair expert in the economics of the championship over the last few weeks. And I think a lot of us have had to get up to speed very quickly. But be assured that there are really, really good people working behind the scenes tirelessly. You know, one of the people who hasn't really had much of a shout out, but I think deserves it, is the club's chief executive who was made redundant but is in day in day out working around the clock to secure the club's future and Wigan Athletic is just full of people like that who are going that extra mile to make sure that we get there including the fans and every single one of you who's put money in who's helped to fundraise who's helped to make sure that we can finish the season like you deserve you deserve every bit of thanks that we've got and you know between us we will get there but we've you know, we've just got to keep going. We've got to, like you said, Jay, we've got to keep believing. And um, I'll be back as soon as I can with hopefully much better news and much more certainty. And, um, uh, you know, and, and the future for this club should be bright. Just hang on to that feeling that you got the other night when it was full time and it was 8 0 and we not just turned up but smashed um, the club record in the middle of all of this just hang on to that feeling and and um i'll see you soon on this podcast to announce something better very much hope absolutely and I'm, I'm glad that you're uh, hopefully going to come on again in the future because you've been an excellent guest on both occasions and obviously keep up the good work and 
just please try and get some sleep as well because uh, you, you deserve the rest. And um, I know it is your priority at the moment, but please look after your own health as well. That's really kind. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much, and thank you for everyone for watching. It's been it's been myself, Jay Whittle, Lisa, and Nandy. Uh, we, we've talked about a lot of issues up here, and hopefully, like like Lisa said, when we next have a podcast together, it'll be with much better news and. Hopefully, um, not hopefully, we're going to save this football club together as one.